Hello precious, dear heart. I am so happy that you are here with us. My name is Nuna Isima and I'm your hostess. Please find yourself a comfortable space where you're not going to be interrupted for the next hour. And you may burn a candle or light some incense or burn some essential oils and create a nice space for you to just soften and relax. And please take a couple of deep belly breaths, calling all of yourself right back into your sacred body temple, right here in this moment of time. And you may exhale with a sound. Ah. And I invite you to feel your connection to Mother Earth, to her supportive, nurturing, nourishing energy, either through the soles of your feet or through your intention. And so I welcome you into this coming session. Hello everybody and welcome back to iRise. I am so excited today for Dr. Andrea Pennington. She is an integrative physician, acupuncturist, meditation teacher, and a number one international best-selling author of several books. She is, um, her ex extensive study of medical nutrition, positive psychology, and neuroscience inspired biohacking led her to create a holistic media platform in eight vitality, blending ancient wisdom with modern science for enhanced vitality and life mastery. Dr. Andrea has co-founded Diamond Life Design with her friend to help people around the world take bold steps to consciously architect an epic life. Andrea is also a documentary filmmaker, highly acclaimed international TEDx speaker, visionary brand strategist, and global lunch activator for light workers and founder of the real self-love movement. As a sought-after media personality, Dr. Andrea has shared her empowering insights on resilience on the Oprah Winfrey Show, the Dr. Oz Show, ITV This Morning, CNN, The Today Show, and many more. I am so happy to have you here on our summit. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nunaisi. It's good to be with you. Your body of work around self-love is so aligned with the message that we want to put across to our audience. Can you talk about the importance of it and how did you came to do what you're doing? Absolutely. Well, for me, I started off in clinical practice as a medical doctor and acupuncturist. And I was working with my mother, who brought a certain uh, interesting perspective to our medical work. She had been working with people who were depressed and women who were addicted to crack cocaine. And this was way back in the 90s when there was a really big crack epidemic in the United States. And one of the interesting things that she found out was that by using these little acupuncture points on the ears, you could help people not only detox from drugs and alcohol, but you could also help them improve their mood, improve their sleep, and improve their ability to go deep in the psychotherapy process to process emotions, to process trauma. And so when we paired up and started working together, we had a program for drug and alcohol addiction 
and for obesity. And one of the things that happened is some of the people who had eating disorders or who had addiction, I discovered that there was a trend among some of these patients. Many of them, as soon as they got into a really holistic environment and they got nurturing and they understood what their triggers were, they would do fine. They would just go on about their lives. But this trend that started to show up was a small subset of our population, just a small subset, would not get better. It didn't matter how many acupuncture needles we put in, how many hours of psychotherapy, and even if they'd undergone surgery for some of their issues. What I discovered is if they didn't have a fundamental love for themselves and acceptance for their worth, worthiness of love and happiness and vitality, then they wouldn't get better. In fact, some of them would sabotage their plans or they would find a new addiction or they would just drop out and we would lose a hold of them. And as I started to investigate, like what is underneath this, we discovered that there was a lot of trauma. Many of these patients had something in common. Either it was sexual abuse or it was physical or emotional abuse, but there was some sort of trauma in their background that either one had not been processed, meaning they never told anyone or they didn't go to therapy, or two, they told someone, but nobody believed them. So they started to hide their experience in shame or they even doubted their experiences. And so it wasn't everyone, but I did notice that for the people who had experienced some form of trauma, it was very hard for them to love and accept themselves. And if they didn't love and accept themselves, then they oftentimes would not get better. And so that's what really started me on this path to understanding self-love or what I call real self-love, because the, the key there is really reconnecting with your authentic self, the you that you really are beyond all of the programming and, and the labels. And so it's been nearly 20 years now that I've been doing this work. And I find that it's, it's the most rewarding. It's also the most challenging, but it's, it is really become my life's work. Right. That uh, link that you're talking about is so fundamental where um, in, any, in any distorted uh, way of living or addiction or a, a deep, um, um, if it's depression or um, any, any kind of outlived uh, situation, the, the missing link is always self-love. And that's also my experience. And you talked about authentic self-love. Can you maybe expand a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Well, we know that <clears throat> most of us are not born into the world hating ourselves, right? Um, if you really think about how a baby comes into the world, a little tiny baby <clears throat> is, is just coming out of a, an experience of oneness where mommy and baby are one all of the baby's needs are met everything is comfortable there is no such thing as hunger because baby can suck everything out of mommy but in that first year of life as soon as this infant starts to recognize that the caregiver and the self are not one and the same then we see what is called the ego start to be formed so the ego is not good or bad it's simply a psychological construct and this ego, with this personality, this sense of I, is developed in order to help us survive. So in other words, the ego only cares about our safety, our security, and our survival. So that's all well and good, unless you happen to have a caretaker who didn't regularly attend to your needs. Then that ego that's just developing could start to imagine that, oh, I don't matter. I cry out and I don't get fed or I get left in wet diapers or what have you. And then of course, as the, the child grows older, if you happen to have an experience with an abusive parent or an emotionally absent parent, or maybe a mean sibling or a mean babysitter or somebody at school who was a bully or a mean teacher or a really aggressive coach, well, that developing ego can start to feel unsafe 
And so it starts to make all sorts of judgments and beliefs about how the world is. Is the world safe or not? Am I safe or not? Am I appreciated and valued or not? Am I um, allowed to express myself or does that put me at risk? And so the challenge is that we adapt. You know, it's one of our fundamental capabilities as a human. We adapt to our circumstances and our situations such that we end up creating almost a false self. So for example, for the people who may have grown up with an alcoholic parent or an abusive parent, they become very tuned into the environment. They can tell how many drinks that parent may have had, or just by the sound of their feet walking in the house, they can tell if they're gonna be in trouble or not. And so what we do as humans is we adapt. We start to either be really nice to people or we, we quiet down or we try to hide, we disappear. And all of those adaptations create this persona or this personality that we show to the world in order to survive and in order to fit in. And that's based on survival. But what happens if my natural inclination is to be bubbly and bouncy and asking questions and maybe I love to sing, maybe I love to dance, maybe I, I love building things. Well, if I happen to be in a circumstance, whether at school, on the playground or at home, where those behaviors were looked down upon or they got me into trouble, then again, the ego may say, it's not safe. It's not safe to do those things. So we start to hide them. And so those aspects of the authentic self end up being pushed into what we call in psychology, the shadow. And it's, not, it's, it's as if we're disowning a part of ourself. Now we can do that to survive for some of us for a very long time, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. But the challenge that I noticed uh, in acupuncture is that energy that we would normally want to express and have circulating in our lives, if we suppress it for too long, it ends up going inward and hurting us. It can cause those symptoms that we just talked about, depression, anxiety, this feeling of unease or un, uh, um, instability that then cause people to look for comfort. So maybe as a child, you didn't get the comforting from an older sibling or a babysitter or an auntie, a grandparent who could say, it's okay, just because you know, dad is doing this or that, it doesn't mean that you're not lovable. So if we don't have those abilities, even within our own mind to reason that just because this person abused me, it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. Then later in life, when we're feeling that stress and that anxiety come back up, because we can of course be triggered from other life circumstances, then we look to comfort ourselves. And so in my experience with many of the clients that I've worked with, that's when people will binge eat or they'll shop or they will do drugs or alcohol or they relationship hop or look for promiscuous sexual adventures, all to kind of quiet down that anxious internal. So what happens is then we are disconnected from what I call the authentic self. And through all of the sort of therapy and, and the books and workshops that I lead, it's all about leading people to, to come back into connection and contact with the authentic self, that part of us that is naturally good, that is naturally whole, and that is naturally lovable. Such a beautiful explanation. I really liked how you tied the, the ego into this whole process of, um, of really creating the survival mechanism to be able to survive in this very harsh world we live in. And uh, I would love to know what is your way to call back the authentic self, to reconnect to the authentic self? What, what is your uh, secrets? <laughs> well, I wish I could tell you there was just one major secret. Um, but in my experience, we, uh, we are each so unique as individuals that what works for me may not work for you, may not work for someone else. But what I have compiled are a list of strategies. And in my book, The Real Self-Love Handbook, and also in The Orgasm Prescription for Women, I outline these five steps. The first step to really reconnecting and, and developing self-love is all about self-awareness. So this is where we start to 
do certain exercises, questionnaires, writing, to start to separate out and bring to our conscious awareness the difference between the authentic self and the false self or the ego personality that we've constructed. And as soon as you can start to recognize the difference between the two, then I ask you to engage in certain activities that help you re-experience your authentic self, but in a safe space. Because again, if it wasn't safe to be your authentic self growing up or as a child or even as an adult, if you were in some sort of an abusive relationship, then it's going to take time for you to start to practice being yourself, showing yourself, being vulnerable, being authentic, and proving to that little um, ego, it's okay. I'm still alive. I'm not being kicked out of the tribe. And so it begins with doing some, some questionnaires to really identify what is the authentic self. And the more that we can do that, it, it's basically retraining the ego to accept who we really are. Um, I find that it's best to do that in community, either a one-to-one -one community with a coach or a therapist, particularly if you still have to process some of your trauma. But we've also created an online community and a global community where we can get together in safe spaces to allow people to express themselves and embody their true self over time. Right. Because really people um, fear from being vulnerable, but being vulnerable is actually a strength. It's not a, it's not a weakness, right? Yeah. And being vulnerable is essential for true intimacy. So if you really want to be in a, a loving, healthy relationship, there's going to come a point where you've got to share your truth. And being vulnerable uh, is that first step towards deep and true intimacy. Right. And then, um, and also being um, in a community, it's almost like uh, dismantling shame, right? Yeah. Because shame is the fear of disconnection, and we all really want to feel connected. So, this is the way to penetrate that, um, that shame, that heaviness of shame, is to become vulnerable and, and, and real. Yes, yes. I experienced exactly what you're talking about, but in the most um, unconventional way. <laughs> so I said that with my patients, I could recognize this trend of a lack of self-love. The reason it was so easy to recognize was because I also went through the majority of my life not loving myself. I was um, very driven and very perfectionistic and I never felt like I got anything just right. I never felt like I was good enough. And when I started to recognize that I didn't love myself, I became very curious. And of course, it's somewhat easy, um, at least for me and my family. My parents were divorced when I was three years old. And my father, because he came from a very um, low socioeconomic class, he happened to grow up around people who said, you've got to get an education. You, that's the way you're going to get a job. You're going to ha have that security. And so for, for me and my siblings, that's what we all heard. You know, you've got to get good grades. You've got to study hard. But I was um, always a very artistic person. I wanted to do singing and dance and theater and band and cheerleading. And every time I wanted to do all of those fun things, my dad would be chiming in saying, you know, but you've got to get good grades. And so it forced me to be very driven and very conscientious about, okay, am I getting good enough grades so that I could be in the school play? You know, have I done everything that I needed to so that I could keep playing trumpet in the band? And so that created this pattern that never really went away. In fact, it started to turn up even in medical school. And when I finally, um, was told that it was actually one of my, um, my coworkers, the COO of my company, pulled me aside one day and he said, hey, you know, are you singing? Are you writing music these days? And I kind of looked at him like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I just noticed that, you know, when you're doing your music, you're in a lot better mood. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. I find my artistic expression through theater and through music and through singing. And I didn't realize how much it was impacting me 
until any time I would start to feel this desire to do something artistic, there would be this internal dialogue going, no, 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 that's not serious. That's, that's too frivolous. You need to do important things like saving people's lives. That's what you need to do. And so over time, I started to feel shame. Anytime that urge would come up, there would be this internal judge telling me how bad that was and how wrong I was for having these impulses. And so I carried around this shame for the longest time until I happened to be at an event and I mentioned something about singing and someone said, oh, well, sing something for me. What you do jazz standards, sing. And I kind of felt comfortable enough with them to do it. And it was the most healing experience because I was finally being seen, appreciated, valued for me, for the things that really bring me joy. And so when you talk about this you know, processing of shame and unburdening of shame, it is about really being able to be in a safe space where you can be your true self. Um, and in my case, having those outsiders give me that feedback allowed me to reprocess it internally because I had heard so for so long that all those, you know, the arts, oh, you can't make a living. That's just silliness. So for me, I had to relearn that it's okay for me to be me and express myself. And getting rid of that shame has been like the greatest gift of all of this journey. Right. I'm sure that so many of the audience can relate to that because we all received our very unique gifts for this lifetime. And so many of us don't um, tune in or can't express it because of previous, um, as you said, wiring or conditioning or expectations or um, just interference straight, straight forward. And, um, and also, I think it's very important to know that when you are yourself, some will love you and some will not. And that is okay because you rather be yourself and attract those that you lo will love you for really who you are than pretend or put on a mask and attract everyone because it doesn't work like that, yeah. right? Exactly. And that's, unfortunately, that's what I did. You know, for so long, I tried to do everything to fit in as a medical doctor. And then later, as I got into my television career, I did exactly what the television executives told me to do. They wanted me to dress so that I looked more mature. They, they even coached me in how to deliver the news. I was hosting documentaries and anchoring the news. And so I put on this, this doctor fa facade or mask and it became very boring and very two dimensional. And ultimately, um, that is what led me to finally just give up on all of it and just surrender and, and really call out to God to say, okay, what am I really supposed to be doing here? Because even though I have all this success on the outside world, I wasn't happy inside. And the interesting thing is that, you know, God can find you where you are shining, when you're doing what you love to do, when you do it because it comes from, your, from the depth of your soul, Yes. That's where you connect to the divine in the most direct way anyway. So yes. for many of us, that connection is disrupted because we're just not on our path. Yeah. Right? And that, exactly. And that is precisely why I do the work that I do today, is to help people liberate themselves from all of that past conditioning so that they can start living their true purpose. And for some people, that means they're going to leave their job they might leave their relationship. Some of them, like me, might even leave their country. <laughs> you know, I left America and now I live in France. Um, but it's all about following your true path. And I, I like what you just said, that each of us are born into this life with certain gifts. We have certain talents. We have a soul print that is unique to us. And when we're not living it, the soul starts to create this, this tension and it shows up in the body. Now, your body may respond differently than mine. For me, it manifested as depression and later as anxiety. But what I saw in some of my patients is that that tension that was created because they weren't living their authentic truth turned into things like autoimmune diseases, um, things like allergies, 
Uh, one woman had interstitial cystitis where she, all of the tension was going into her bladder. For other people, it was endometriosis, fibroids, cancer. And so this body of ours is really a wonderful indicator of whether you're living in alignment with your true purpose, your path, and your, your own vitality code. Right, exactly that, the, the wisdom of the body. You know when something feels good in your, in your system, whether it comes from your authentic self or from the ego or um, conditioning. You, you feel it in your body, you feel the energy. So just really to become aware and sensitive to those messages right yeah and so let's talk a moment about a uh, orgasm prescription for women because i love that title <laughs> <laughs> okay and i love the book i've listened to it on audio and it's absolutely the next level oh so, thank you yeah we'd love to hear a little bit more about that for uh, our audience Yes. Well, uh, it's interesting because I, I didn't intend to ever write a, a book about women's sexuality, but exactly as I've been describing to you, I started to have patients that were expressing that they were not experiencing pleasure in their bodies. They were having a, a hard time achieving orgasm or even just experiencing pleasure in their intimate relationships. And once again, not everyone, but some of these women were hiding um, or had not yet processed some of the trauma or abuse in their past. And what I help people to understand is that your body is going to reflect your internal world. And if in your mind, you're judging yourself, judging your body, judging you know, how you look or how you smell or how you taste, then you're not gonna be fully present. If you um, haven't processed out that old trauma, then every touch is going to reactivate that stress response in your brain. And so in the orgasm prescription, I'm really just helping women and the people who love women understand how the brain and how the ego are reacting to things, how you can deactivate them if you do have some triggers in there, and how you can embrace a healthier lifestyle and mindset so that you can re-enter your body and re-enter intimate relationships and experience this orgasmic bliss that everyone is entitled to. Right. And can you talk a little bit about how you can um, um, overcome those triggers, how you can uh, pass or move through them? Yes. Well, for some, they, they will need a coach or a therapist, you know, because if in the book, I list several guided meditations. I also have uh, healing exercises for healing the, the wounded inner child. But if doing these exercises re-traumatizes or reactivates you, then that's a sign that you clearly need someone to walk with you on that journey, whether that's a therapist or a coach, or it could be a friend, but generally you're gonna want someone with professional experience. But again, as we were talking about with self-love, it's the same with healing and processing sexual trauma. It's a matter of going in and understanding what meaning did you attach to those experiences and what beliefs do you now hold about yourself? So many people don't think about this. Do you deserve pleasure? Like That's a question. Um, you know, I was on uh, television in the UK and they did a survey over the weekend before my TV spot. And they surveyed 2,000 people in the United Kingdom and a high number of them said they feel guilty if they have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. This is women. And so it begs this question, how often do you ask yourself, do I deserve pleasure? If it takes me longer than my partner to achieve orgasm, is that bad? Because many women will, will just say, oh, I don't really need to worry about it. I'll just let my partner have their pleasure or I'll fake it. So the first thing that we have to do is again, in this awareness phase of this self-discovery process is to really start to identify what are my beliefs about myself, my right to pleasure, uh, my body, my partner, because if there's anything that is 
hindering you from fully surrendering and being present and enjoying the fact that your beloved is with you, then that is going to impact your ability to have an orgasm because the brain is going to register any of those blocks as a reason to not go there. Because in order for us to experience that sort of ecstasy, we have to let go. We have to surrender. And so identifying those blocks is, is always the first key. And then, as I said, between the guided meditations, um, the journaling, and these other exercises for healing the wounded inner child, there are a number of things in, in the book that will help you. Right, so go get that book because that is a gem of so much wisdom shared. Thank you. And, um, and I want to ask you, um, so in, in, a, in a journey of self-discovery, right, you having those um, um, inquiry with yourself and you understand some things, okay, this came from that space and that happened because of that situation. Now, what, what is the next step? What do you do with it? How do you um, rewire that, um, that uh, in, in your brain so the neuro um, connections are different? And how, how do you do that work? The next step I would, I would recommend is something that we call life writing. Um, in the world of psychology, there are a number of processes. You can call it expressive writing or narrative therapy. The process that I use is called life writing. And what we're inviting you to do is first and foremost, just get all of your emotion out. If there was something that, that happened in the past, or if it's just right now, you're just unsatisfied and unhappy with um, some aspect of your life, let's say it's sensuality, then you're just gonna write, just write, just get everything out. It, you never have to show it to anyone. It doesn't have to be read by anyone. You could even burn it afterward. But first you wanna just get all of the emotion out. That's step one. If there is a specific incident, either in the past or in your current relationship, then I want you to write about the lowest point ever. So if it was a traumatic experience, then you're just gonna write about it. And again, you can just do free, free writing, not worrying about editing it or spelling, not worrying about if it's good enough or if people are gonna think you're bad. This is only for you. Just get it out. Now, if you can also write in a separate exercise, what does all of that mean? What does it mean about me? What are the decisions and beliefs that you've made because of those uh, dark times or that dark period in your life? Once you've got all of that out, many people will just feel so much better because they've finally taken all of that anxiety provoking thoughts or secrets and gotten it out. You don't even have to say it to someone. There's something about writing. I think it could work if you're typing, but definitely writing is activating certain parts of the brain. It's allowing you to reconnect with that authentic. Like if you think of the word author, author and authentic, it's you're getting in, in touch with the voice that wants to be heard. And often it is a more primitive or a childish voice that just finally wants to be heard and seen. After you've done those couple of exercises, then you wanna write um, about what, what would you like your future to look like? If you were able to put all of that in perspective, forgiving the people who needed forgiveness, forgiving yourself if needed, giving yourself a bunch of compassion, if you were able to, to look at this from today going forward, what would you like your life to be about as you leave? And so this is a little bit of get, getting into what uh, we call future casting. So we don't necessarily have to say that those things didn't happen, but if there was any positive or, or redemptive quality, maybe you learned a magical lesson, maybe, I don't know, you acquired some new skills that now you're going to help other people. What would you want your future to sound like? And write about that as well. This is one of those things that really helps to re-engage the authentic self and the ego. And uh, it also gives you the opportunity to reprogram. And so if you can do that, then you can start to give your ego a reason to let go of the fear um, and you can invite that part 
that tender part of you that was wounded or that was scared to imagine what the future would be like. Because if we leave that wounded part stuck, silent, in shame or in secrecy, then he or she doesn't get to grow up. But when you can be the, the compassionate adult that says, I hear you, get all of your feelings out, there is no shame here, I accept you, then you're inviting that, that part to grow up in a loving and safe environment with you as the adult, the protector, the compassionate caregiver. And you can then uh, make a promise to that part of yourself saying, you know what? I'm never gonna make you shut up again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow you to be heard. I'm gonna allow you to be seen. I will protect you. It's, it's terrible, these things that happened, um, but going forward, I will be here. I will never leave you. And that gives that wounded inner child the ability to, to do some maturing so that it's not constantly driving you. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes so much sense. I have done so much work on my um, wounded child for, for over two decades um, because I had to, because my child yeah. was just one big mess and I knew from a very young age that I had to work with it. And what I found, which was really interesting, is that um, a lot of the uh, people, when they get into that wounded child, they they try to protect those that hurt them because there is a, a very natural tendency to love, especially our parents. Mm -hmm. And so if they hurt us, there is almost, um, it's, it's almost part of our survival mechanism to, to go and try and protect them and say, yeah, he, my father hit me, but that because, that's because I was really disbehaving and he was so tired after a, a full day of work and, so there was always those excuses that um, people came up with when I've done um, all sorts of workshops and groups and retreats. And, uh, and I found that fascinating where, um, you know, some, some can also, um, you know, say, um, you know, yeah, they hurt me and they bad, but a lot really reserve the way they feel and trying to almost, um, yeah, protect the, the others. Do, do you find that uh, happens? How is it uh, from your experience? Yes, absolutely. Um, particularly for people who experience things early, early in their childhood. Because as that developing ego, the ego knows I'm too young to go survive on my own. So I have to belong in this family. I have to get along. And I, and we do, we, we are born naturally wanting to love our caregivers and our parents. We want to love them. And so there is this sort of a dichotomy, the part of us that recognizes that some of our caregivers were really mean and did horrible things, and yet I love them. And so they feel this need for protection. But there does come a point when you as the adult can, can still love a parent or a caregiver but not love their behavior. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, get to a point where you love yourself enough to create boundaries. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, we do work um, with boundaries as well to help people recognize that just because you love them does not a allow them to continue to behave in the same ways or, or even in the same relationship as you're older. Um, and the, but it's, it's, it's not something that happens all at once. You know, there has to be a sense of you as, a, as the adult recognizing that you deserve to have a parent who loved you and didn't abuse you. You deserve to have a parent who appreciated you and allowed you to be seen and heard and didn't shame you. And recognizing that those behaviors, even if you're going to make excuses for it, oh, well, I know why my dad did it because he was abused by his dad and he didn't know any better. And you know, whether you're putting the finger of, of blame out there or on you, like, well, maybe I was noisy or I, I was a bad kid. It doesn't matter. We still have to recognize that there are certain behaviors that every precious human life deserves to have certain positive experiences. And this definitely should be uh, protected from those negative ones. Right. And it can play out in the current relationships, uh, right, with the... Um 
adults in your life and, and this time that you, you can really get your power and say, okay, that is not working for me anymore and let's create a different dynamic or even end the relationship for some time if, if it can go beyond that dynamic that is not healthy for me, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that sometimes requires a lot of courage. And again, that's why we like to do things in community so that you don't feel alone. Because again, if you decide to, to create a boundary or to say no more, part of the ego is going to think, but can I survive? Can I survive on my own? And that's just millions of years of evolution that have made us believe that we need our tribes. We need these groups in order to survive. Um, but yes, we definitely need to get to a point in our adult lives where we recognize patterns. Because one of the things that came up for, for me looking at patients, you know, I was young when I first started my practice. I was, you know, just turning 30. And it, it seemed very curious to me. Like, if you had an abusive parent, why would you marry someone who would abuse you? Mm -hmm. um, but we do have these unconscious drivers that's that those familiar patterns that a person recognized in a caregiver can seem attractive not like sexy attractive but attractive to that wounded part that says oh but maybe i can fix it this time maybe i'll actually be good enough maybe i'll actually get the love and the acceptance and that it sounds like completely crazy talk until you start to see this pattern over and over and over and so we do have to recognize our patterns. Why am I attracted to some people? Why do I tolerate certain bad behavior with, uh, you know, either at work or in intimate relationships? So it's, it's, it's a process, but it's one that's so gratifying because as people do reconnect with their authentic self and their authentic voice, and they start to express themselves in ways that they realize they are acceptable and lovable for who they really are, then everything can shift and change. It's not overnight, but over time, these amazing, amazing shifts and transformations happen. And that allows us to be healthier for everyone in our lives, especially our children. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, when you start the journey consciously, when you make that decision, it's like the universe comes and, and wraps you, you know, in, in, in the wings of love and, shows you the next step and the next teacher appears and you you kind of start the engine and all the unseen love and guidance um conspires to to move you in that direction because really um when you in your full power authentic self you are a powerhouse of so much potential and this is really why you are here and the, the 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 earth and the planet is calling all yes. of you to come back home yes. into your body so you can be the magnificent self that you are meant to be that you are born to be that you have everything in your body to activate just by making that aware choice yes yes nunaisi you've said it perfectly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and um, tell me a little bit about um, your um, your um, school that you created. Well, it's not so much a school, but um, the Real Self Love Movement mm -hmm. is a um, a global community of other leaders therapists, doctors, and healers around the world, along with myself, are leading the Real Self Love Movement through masterclasses, through interviews, and events uh, in different cities around the world. And so it's really, um, there is an online academy where you get to watch all this material and work through these processes that I've outlined. Um, and it's totally free. Um, that is my gift to the world, to provide this kind of support for people who may have been afraid to go into therapy or who just want to be in a community while they're doing these healing processes. Beautiful. I've said that before and I say it again, you know, we, we hurt in relationship and it's through relationship that we heal. Yeah. It's when we, it's when we can take a deep breath and say something that we 
we really conceive as a, as a monster that we've been hiding away, running away from, hiding it in the attic or under the carpet. And here we stand almost being naked and share it with others. And they just accept it and, and accept you and, and feel more connected to you and love you for having the courage to share something like that. I think that's, that's where you really grow tremendously in, in a moment. Yes, I agree. hundred percent. It's like a quantum leap in, in, in a, in a, in just that, that simple process. Precisely. Because coming home to the authentic self, you're connecting to the divine and the divine is all powerful. That is the creative spark that is within us. So it literally can be a quantum leap, a quantum shift. Right. And tell me, I know that you offer in our audience a beautiful gift, and I would like you to talk a little bit about it and tell them what it is. Yeah, so part of what happens when we need to reactivate um, the sensual side of ourselves is we start with the senses. So I have a program, 21 Days of Bliss, where each day you will receive uh, an email from me that includes a lovely quote, a card, and a, a guided audio with some exercises that you're going to do to reactivate your senses. This is to heighten your sensuality, to help you feel more confident in your body so that you can experience that uh, ecstatic bliss that we talked about. So it's totally free and it will give you a very good taste of the 21 day program that's in the orgasm prescription for women. So totally free, you can do this 21 day program and find that your senses and your body and your sensuality get turned on again. Right, because it can, right? Even if yes. you don't feel it at the moment, even if it's been years since it's been activated, or even if it's never been activated, it is there and you can activate it and it's absolutely possible. And thank you so much for offering such a beautiful gift. I know that a journey of 21 days really create um, a lasting change, right? The 21 days kind of a, a timeline is really powerful. So um, yeah, hop onto that and do that 21 days. That will completely transform and change your life for the better. So really encouraging you to do that. And if... Um, if a woman wants to get hold of you and work with you directly, how can they get hold of you? Well, you can learn about my workshops and online programs by visiting andreapennington.com. And you can join the Real Self Love Movement totally for free. Visit realself.love. And that's where you can get the guided meditations, the Real Self Love Manifesto, and all of the master classes and interviews. Oh, wow. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you on this summit. You added so much value and I'm sure that everyone felt the same and uh, you must listen to it again and again because uh, every time a little bit more will sink in. There's so much rich content that has been shared here. Thank you so much, Andrea. You are such you. an angel doing so much good in this world. Bless you. Thank you so much. And I honor you for all of the good work that you're doing to help spread this message around the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman you are. Blessings on your journey. And everyone else, ciao for now. Ciao. Thank you so much for being with us on this session. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did enjoy making it. Please share all your comments, insights, takeaways, questions in the comments below and spread it with your girlfriends and sisters and friends so this healing can touch as many women as possible. And you may also purchase the All Access Pass to have lifetime access to this resource so you can revisit it and dive deeper again and again. And thank you to the Sacred Feminine Mystery School for sponsoring this summit. I wish you blessings on your journey and until we meet again, 
all my love namaste